Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at changinghighered.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Well, hello, listeners, and welcome to our annual end of year review where we take a look back at 2023. It's been one heck of a year. And guess who I've got? My regular host to do this, Deb Maui. Deb, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Drum. I'm delighted to be here. I say this every year, but I can't believe it's been a whole year since we did this the last time. No kidding. And it's been a crazy year. You know, we just before coming on air today, looking back and talking about some of the things that have happened I don't ever remember a year in higher ed like this. Do you? No, I've been in higher ed for more years than I like to think about. 17 now, I guess. And this is the craziest year I've seen. Um, It's been wild. Well, there's a reason that I have such gray hair and such little. I can't understand why you. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe I shouldn't have said that. I don't know. (laughs) It's okay. No. No, well, you know, I do marketing and enrollment for a 6,000 student university in Aurora, Illinois, Aurora University. And it's been a wild year of change for us. We have a new president and new strategies. We're embarking on a new strategic plan. So last year was a wild ride, and this year is going to be another wild ride. Oh, no kidding. And I've seen that happen so many times when you get a new president in especially after there's been an incumbent there for a number of years, not only is there going to be new direction based on market forces and other things like that, but new personalities to learn and work with, et cetera. So yeah, a lot of changes I can just imagine. Yeah. New president after our prior president was there for 23 years. So yep, exactly. Wow. Mm -hmm. And your previous president was a woman, if I remember correctly. Yep. Our previous president was a woman and our new president is, is a woman as well. And our, our first Latina president, which is wonderful, given that we're a Hispanic serving institution, about 40% of our students are Hispanic. And so there's just a lot of excitement from the students and the faculty and the staff. That's neat. That's really neat. And bringing a new president in, if it's done properly with good onboarding and things like that, it really makes that transition so much easier. At the same time, new processes, new strategies, it's a time of, can be a time of, of transformation for an institution. Yeah, our board was really intentional about the onboarding process, and we had a strategic plan around the onboarding process and how everything was going to work, and it, it really made a huge difference. I think one of the, in, in talking to the search firm, one of the frustrations of new presidents is that they felt like they didn't have enough onboarding. So our board really paid paid a lot of attention to that to make sure that uh, Susana was talking to the to all the people she needed to talk to and getting the information she needed. Yeah, we did a project like that for the University of South Carolina a little while back, where the new president, even though he had been the provost there for a few years, then he went up to your neck of the woods at yeah. University of Illinois, Chicago. Mm-hmm. Coming back, a lot of things had changed. So we did probably 60 different interviews with people and really got a good lay of the land for not only him, but for the board so that he was able to make the transition in almost seamlessly. It's That's really great. important. It is. It is. So, well, I know... Based on what we did last year, the first thing I'm going to do is get graded. So we may as well get yep, to yep. it. Yep, This is my favorite part <laughs> is grading you on how you did. So let's go through the list of your prognostications from last year and see how you did. First of all, college enrollment will continue declining. Well, I think I probably nailed that one, even though there was one report that came out and said it's finally turned around. But if you really look at the details behind that report, it prognosticates, maybe not the best word to use in this, <laughs> but prognosticates that we're going to have some challenges. And we'll talk about that more. But I would say 
on, on a scale of A versus excellent and F being I blew it, I'd say that was probably about a B. I, th- I think you got an A on that one. Oh. Oh, oh, you gave yourself a B? Oh, I'd give you an A on that one. Okay, I'm a tough grader. Thank you. You're a tough grader. Yeah. Okay. Next, more colleges and universities will close slash merge or be acquired. I'd say I did pretty pretty good with that one. Mm-hmm. And it's going to get even worse this year mm-hmm. with the demographic cliff, with the finances. Uh, again, we'll talk more about this, but the bottom line is if you're an institution with less than 1,000 or 1,500 students, you got a lot of work to do because you re- probably, unless you've got a huge endowment, you probably don't have the sustainability that you need to keep going for very long. Yeah, I agree. I think if it weren't for the COVID assistance, we would have seen more colleges and universities, primarily as to your point, small colleges closing this year. But because they got that boost, it just delayed the inevitable for a lot of schools. So I agree with you there. I'd give yeah. you an A on that one too. Well, th- those were pretty easy ones, really. Yeah, okay, you're the, right. The, the COVID assistance made a huge difference, and it kept these folks in business. I know one institution that I worked with, they got $3.5 million from the federal government just on the first COVID monies going around, and that certainly made a huge difference for them. Right. All right. More hybrid and fully online models will emerge at colleges and universities. Oh, yes, that is true. But there is a impending problem because everybody went to having some sort of hybrid or online program because of COVID. And now we're looking at an oversupply. So guess what? Too much supply, not enough not enough students, that's not a good recipe. Agreed. Although I guess I have a slightly different take on hybrid. And I just think we're going to continue to see students wanting, because students got used to online classes during COVID, I think they like having online classes and they like having a mix of in-class and online. So I think when you look at individual programs, you're going to continue to see a mix of just learning modalities because I think people realize even if it's technically an on-ground class, not every class has to be in person. I agree 120% if that's even possible. (laughs) But here's the challenge with that. Many institutions have different courses for online versus Mm face-to-face. They don't have, they're not ubiquitous. And so being able to have students have, you know, just say an English 101 course, be able to take an English 101 course on the ground versus online, the on the ground folks may not say this is valid. So Mm -hmm. there's still issues that have to be worked out that never were worked out during the COVID time. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. All right. Politics will continue to be an issue in higher ed. Well, duh. (laughs) Yeah. I've never seen, well, I don't want to say that this is a function of the divisiveness in the country, but it is a function of the divisiveness in the country. They will continue to have problems. We'll talk about this more, but if you take a look at what's going on in a number of the red states, yeah, it's really challenging. And even in Ohio just recently with their bringing in a new president, that whole process. I actually had a phone call from a student. She was in tears about the whole process. Hmm. And it's like, how did you find my name? Oh, this is interesting. The union, the student union wanted to hire me to fix this for them. And of course, there's nothing I can do. Right. But you've got Florida, you've got Ohio, North Mm -hmm. Idaho College, Michigan State even is Mm -hmm. there. But yeah, it's causing a lot of, lot of challenges. And, you know, how do you, if I, if I want to get really snarky, it's like, how do you define free speech anyway? Right. <laughs> we could have a whole series of podcasts on that. Oh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. All right. All right. Next badges, certificates, stackable certificates, and micro credentials will continue to grow. But how many people will recognize these? 
you know, that's a really, that I, that's very true. They are growing leaps and bounds. I've had folks on the podcast to talk about this. The National Clearinghouse, I think, is a good idea. And HLC, the accreditor for Midwest, is starting just that. A good friend of mine, Melanie Booth, has taken over that. And they're figuring out a way how to be able to rate and accredit the certificate program. So I think this is moving in the right direction. I think the challenge there from an institutional standpoint is these programs are small. And each individual program doesn't generate a lot of revenue, but there's a lot of administrative costs with them. So how do you make it work from a financial standpoint? Clearly, you have to figure out a way to make it work because it's what students want, but it's, it's, it's challenging. It's not like a, launching a four-year degree program or a new master's program where it brings in a lot of revenue. So Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. The, the challenge being is, like you say, student want these things, and even employers want them provided they're teaching the right skills. And that's still up for debate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we'll give you, I will give you, we'll give you a B on that one. Yeah. Okay. We'll give you a B. Negotiating with the professor. (laughs) (laughs) Something's never changed. Uh, More universities will begin alliances, especially back end alliances so that they can focus on their core mission. They don't need to be cities unto themselves. You know, I'm seeing some of this, but I'm not seeing as much as I would have liked to. There's a couple of groups out there that do these type of things without giving commercials to to anybody. There are folks out there that are doing it. What I'm starting to see, though, is universities banding together, whether it be with a system or it be just banding together because they're in the same city or the same geographic area and starting to trade courses back and forth, trade professors, et cetera. So students might go to University of Bridgeport, or they might go to Connecticut State for the course if it's just not available. So I'm starting to see that, which is good, and it's really needed. Well, you have the example of Pennsylvania, where they've formed... Yes. Yeah, formed groups where three institutions are, they haven't completely merged, but they're sharing a lot of the back end support. Yeah. Well, that, that was a necessity because they didn't have enough students for right. all of those. So right. when helping to cut down on the overhead that the state was having to pay, but the ability to share and things like that, it also cuts down on costs significantly because you've got one president, you've got one provost, et cetera. So it it helps in that respect as well. Right, right. So maybe we'll give you a C on that one because we haven't seen that much of it. Yeah, that's fine. (laughs) Uh, President's roles will continue to become more complex and presidential tenure will continue to decrease. Oh, yes. Presidential tenure has gone down at least three years in the last 10 years. And the job is far more complex. Just take a look at the whole debacle around the Israel Hamas, the congressional testimony. It's absolutely ridiculous. We'll get into this in a little bit, but unfortunately, I I have said for years that the the university presidentship is the most difficult CEO, or second most difficult in industry anywhere. I always said it was behind that of a hospital, but I'm not Mm -hmm. so sure anymore. Hospitals deal with life and death, but you've got a lot of university systems who also have medical centers. So I'm beginning to think that the the complexity of the presidency is almost untenable at this point. Yeah, they used to say that the provost was the worst job in higher education, but I think now it's president. It's just, it's too much for one person, too yeah. complex. Yeah, I'm starting to see more co-presidents, but, you know, even that is is problematic. I think it's a thing that the boards need to get far more I don't want to say involved. They need to be helping the president more. There's two roles for the board. One is oversight and one is consulting. And right. traditional higher ed is, you know, if it's policy, it's the board's purview. If it's operations, it's the president's. There's got to be a meeting of the minds to be able to help the president because it's getting to be too complex. Mm-hmm. Agreed. I'll give you an A on that one. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> You're wrong. You're an easy uh, grader. <laughs> well, yeah. 
<laughs> well, I just gave you a C on the last ones. Yeah, uh, I know, but that technology was generous will, too. <laughs> technology will continue to drive innovation. Accreditors will begin to better support these types of initiatives. Yes, definitely. AI is changing everything. People don't know exactly what to do with that from the innovation perspective. From the accreditors, I, I don't think the accreditors are up on this just yet, but they're going to be catching up. They're going to have to. Yep. Agreed. You know, I think it's interesting. AI, that one of the challenges with AI is that the students know way more about it than the faculty or the administration. So that presents a lot of its own challenges. Oh, yeah. Well, you've got digital natives who are right. your students and faculty, just like everybody. We do things the way we were taught. We were taught lecture style. So that's how we learn. Why, why is it any different? Well, yep. faculty have to learn that they need to be the guide on the side, not the sage on the stage. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to facilitate the conversation. And they need to figure out how to use the technology in a way that drives student learning. Right. I.e., give an assignment, make them do it using AI, and then get them to look at it critically and say, what makes sense, what doesn't? So right. you're teaching critical thinking and AI at the same time. Right. So. Agreed. All right. And the last one, faculty governance will get harder to deal with than it used to be now that AAUP and NEA have joined forces. I don't know that this, I think I blew it completely on this one. Well, no one's perfect. Well, close. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're in the season of perfection with Christmas, but that's, you know, this is not about spirituality. This right. is about academics and higher ed. Uh, faculty governance I am actually encouraged by what I am seeing. There are pockets there, and usually it's a reaction to what's going on. AAUP, and I, I had a gentleman, one of the co-sponsors co of the report, David Reicher. AAUP came out with their study just recently. It's only their eighth special report they've done in their hundred and... 20 years of being in existence. The first one had to do with the Red Scare and McCarthyism, so that mm -hmm. gives you an idea of the type of events they look at. This one had to do with the state of Florida and what's going on down there, and it was sobering, everything that's going on. So, you know, I don't know that it's any harder to deal with, but it's still you know, faculty governance and getting everybody on the same board. I'm going to revert back to the one that I got the A on for the, the president's role being more difficult. As long as you have disparate groups having to come together to form a shared vision, it's always going to be a challenge. Agreed. One of the things that makes higher ed interesting. Oh, yes. <laughs> and that old Chinese curse. May right. you live in interesting <laughs> times. Interesting time. Oh, and aren't they now? Yes. All right. Well, I think overall you did pretty well on your predictions. I think but, you're an easy grader. Well, you know, no, I think you did well. So let's just look at the year in review and the things that we didn't anticipate or didn't anticipate to the extent that they happened. Well, I think as even though you were really nice with your grading on the political theater for 2023, I think we're going to get to a whole new level here in 2024. I just mentioned about the AAUP special report. We did the podcast on with, with Dave Reichman here just recently. Sobering, absolutely sobering of what's gone on there in Florida. If you haven't read the report, you can come up to the website, listen to the podcast. It's, I don't know another way to do it. This, I don't understand how a government can come out and legislate stop woke or mm -hmm. things like that. It, to me, this is clearly a violation of the First Amendment. You know, the government shall not enact any laws prohibiting free speech. Florida's tact is that their public institutions, the state, quote, owns them. We should be able to tell them what to teach. 
The higher ed model has been based on academic freedom for years and years, and we have the top institutions. We have the, high, the best system in the world. And I'm not saying this just because I'm an American and, you know, mm -hmm. rah, rah, mm -hmm. flag. We do. The research, the teaching, does it need some tweaking now? Absolutely. But the reason it's worked so well is because we've had great faculty that's, who have graduated from great schools to be able to continue this tradition. So, you know, that's enough about, about Florida. We're also seeing the politics going into Congress resulted in the resignation of University of Pennsylvania's president and board chair. Mm -hmm. That was a sad event. For me, it's like free speech, okay? If students want to protest what Israel is doing over there in the Middle East, they should have the right to do it. Where do you draw the line? What makes it really concerning for me is the representative who's in the Republican leadership who really took on the task of attacking these three women presidents, mm -hmm. saying, one down, two to go. Mm -hmm. It's like, come on, folks. This is pure retribution. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got North Carolina, and I know Kevin Gustowitz, who is the, I, I don't know if he is the former president of UNC Chapel Hill at this point, but he's going up to Michigan State. Kevin, wish you all the best on this. You're, you're going from one great institution to another great institution. And I know you're going to make a big difference. But here's the challenge. They put an interim president in there who has very little higher ed experience. Mm -hmm. You know, he's an adjunct professor at Duke, which is a private university. So. The politics is going to continue. I already talked a little bit about Youngstown State. That's, you know, Jim Tressel, who was the football coach from Ohio State, was the president there for years, and he left. Mm -hmm. So they brought in somebody, you know, it's like, okay, we're seeing that new college of Florida. I, I've belabored the politics stuff enough. It's and you can feel the energy in the room going down talking about this. <laughs> it's know. like, you know, let's move on. To let's some, move on. Let's, let's move, move on. on to something even more negative. The public, public perception, perception of, of higher education. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe what's happened. And, you know, it's gone down to 36% last year in mid-year Gallup poll from... 57% in 2015. So in eight years, it's dropped uh, a lot. <laughs> I'm not going to do the math. <laughs> a lot. It's dropped a lot. And those are people who they say they've got a great deal of faith in higher ed or, or quite a lot of faith. I think it's multiple things that are causing this. I think one the perception of people, they don't feel, and owners, business owners and, and employers don't feel that folks are graduating from college with the skills that they need. It's been too much of an ivory tower. It's improving. There's a lot of institutions out there who are starting to use advisory boards. But there and again, you start getting into the academic freedom portion of things that say, you know, course content is my purview because I'm the faculty member. Well, you can't live in a silo. You've got to start mm -hmm. taking input in. So I think that's part of it. What we're also seeing is companies are removing the requirements for a bachelor's degree. You know, if you've got the experience, seven states have dropped the degree requirements. So we're seeing that. We're also seeing the certificate programs and the alternative education is growing up. Some companies value these things. One report I read said 75% of respondents say their company values certificate programs. But there's other skills that you're learning in a four-year degree, including social skills, things like that. Critical thinking, if you take a look at what AACNU has done, you know, the, the top skill is teamwork. 
followed by critical thinking, followed by being able to analyze data. So there's, there's good value. I think higher ed needs to, to change a little bit. The only thing that gives me hope here is that even though public perception of higher ed is declining, I mean, when they, you survey parents about whether they want to send their children to college, those numbers are still very high. So sort of on a macro level, there's a lack of confidence in higher ed, but I think the majority of people still feel like college is a good thing. Well, I, I, I think you're right. I think one of the big drivers for this is the price of college at this point in time. It used to be college was considered to be a public good. It was well supported through the states, et cetera. The California experiment, you know, had the UC system and they created the Cal State system, et cetera. And it was, you know, you could go to get a four-year degree for under $10,000. You can't get a meal pass nowadays for under $10,000 at many colleges. And so we've got to figure out how we make it affordable and so kids are not coming out with significant student loans. Right. It used to be that it was fairly easy for students to self-finance their education without a lot of debt, and those days are really gone. Oh, absolutely. I was talking with one institution that their degree program, it's an AA degree, is about $20,000. Mm-hmm. And if they can get Pell Grants for that, Pell Grant 7500 about mm-hmm. that, and then the state grant on top of it. Mm-hmm. Students can get through the degree. Mm-hmm. But without that financing, it's just, it's too much. Mm-hmm. Agreed. So. All right. Well, let's move over to enrollment admissions and admissions near and dear to my heart. So the Supreme Court did away with affirmative action. Mm-hmm. Surprise? No, not a bit. Given the makeup of the court right now and... Things like doing away with Roe versus Wade, which I know a lot of the Christian colleges who may be listening will probably be unsubscribing here and now. Don't do that, by the way. It's not a good idea. It doesn't surprise me. You're seeing a lot of states doing away with funding for DEI initiatives. You've had the showdown of, at the OK Corral with the Board of Regents and the Wisconsin Legislature. We're seeing a lot of upheaval. I I can remember years ago in the state of California, a guy by the name of Baki sued for reverse discrimination. Mm -hmm. I remember that case. And I I don't remember what it was, but I remember California did away with affirmative action at that point. But they moved on to a different model that, that has actually been beneficial from enrollment and whatnot. So... It doesn't surprise me at all that happened, but we've got to figure out just telling people things like, oh, slavery, you know, it gave people good skills. Oh, come on, folks. That's ridiculous. The structures have been in place a long time that make it far more difficult for minorities, especially blacks, to move up. To me, the affirmative action was important. We've got to figure out a way to be able to make sure that it is liberty and equality for all, not just those who can pay for it. Agreed. Agreed. There is, there's a positive thing going on, direct admissions. And that one's, I'm going to kick over to you because that is, is Aurora doing direct admissions? We're piloting it this year with a couple of our top, feeder high schools. So we don't have any results on it yet because we've just started the pilot. And it's still fairly new, right? So there aren't a lot of schools out there that have results. Sort of initial results are kind of meh in that you get a lot more applications, but it doesn't necessarily boost enrollment. But it's, again, it's still new. I think that there's opportunity for improvement in how it is administered. And like I said, we're going to pilot it this year with a couple of our top feeders and see what we get from it. 
So I'll probably have more to say on that when we talk about the 2024 in review. I look forward to hearing about that. Personally, I think it's a great idea when you tell a student, yes, you're accepted to come in. You've got to figure out a way to convert that person to actually coming, Mm -hmm. but it gives you a far greater opportunity versus having them apply. Yeah, it's a way to start the conversation and get them engaged. And then the earlier you can do that and the more you can establish that relationship, get them on campus for a visit, the better. Absolutely. You get them excited about it. That's the Mm -hmm. way to to get them to enroll. Right. So from a positive note, back to the downers. (laughs) Yeah. Finances and budget cuts. It's a mess. (laughs) Yeah. Lions and tigers and bears. (laughs) Oh my. It's a mess. It is an absolute mess. You know, student debt was up at $1.7 trillion. I don't know what it is now with some of it being forgiven. It's probably down about $1.5, I would guess, somewhere in there, wanting to do more. Fitch is forecasting financial challenges for colleges in 2024. I personally think that if your enrollment is below 1000 or even $1,500, you are at risk unless you have a very, very large endowment. And a lot, of the, a lot of the Christian colleges do have large endowments, but there's quite a number of colleges, Christian and otherwise, that do not. And they expect, Fitch is talking about, flagship public universities will continue to grow. Selective privates will continue to grow. They'll see favorable enrollment, is the term they use. but you're seeing your regional publics Mm -hmm. struggling. And to me, the only way you can overcome something like that is make sure you're laser focused on your mission and your value proposition. What programs distinguish you? I agree. I also think it's it's important, particularly for the small liberal arts colleges, to help students understand how to talk about the skills that they learn from a liberal arts education. And Beloit College, where my son goes, is an interesting example. They've gotten a lot of press lately for those skills. And I'm going to use the term skills infusion. That I don't think that's the term that they use, but mapping the skills that a student learns in each class so that a student comes out with the language to talk about what they've learned from their liberal arts education in a way to when they're talking to potential employers. And obviously that's for programs that don't map directly to a, <clears throat> a specific career. So it, it, I think schools are going to have to do that, particularly the smaller liberal arts colleges are going to have to do that to demonstrate the value of a liberal arts education. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. It's very challenging because students come out And they don't necessarily know how to language what they've learned. Mm -hmm. I look at my Naval Academy, you know, I, I, well, you know, I tell people I've had a technical training. I didn't really get an education, but the Naval Academy, 80% of graduates have to be STEM majors. I was a physics major. Go figure. (laughs) I also had to take what we used to call bull courses, liberal Mm -hmm. arts courses. Mm Mm-hmm. We t- I took, besides freshman English, you know, 101, 102, et cetera, where I learned to write, also took Chaucer and his age, took literature of the sea, things like that. I took political courses. I took legal courses. So I got a well-rounded education. I personally don't think, and I've talked to a number of presidents who agree with this, I don't think going fully STEM is the way to do it. It's got to be a balanced education. And Dave Decker at at Franklin University, who we'll talk about them in a little bit, David does the same way. It's like, we've got to be able to give students a good, rounded education and get them ready for their jobs. I think that's the number Mm -hmm. one thing, why that and cost is why the faith in higher ed has dropped. Is mm-hmm. students are graduating, they don't know how to find jobs. They don't know what skills they have. And the employers, you know, it's, it's that same thing, plus, of course, the cost. Agreed. 
So just back to the financial challenges, we've seen huge budget cuts at some large institutions, West Virginia, University of Nebraska at Lincoln, really huge cuts that will affect the programs that they offer. Thoughts about that? You know, it's it's sad to see that. They, you know, I I know Gordon Gee. I have the utmost respect for him at West Virginia. From what I've read, because I've not talked to him about this, what I've read is that they opened up a bunch of new programs and their projections were a little rosier than they needed to be. Mm -hmm. This is obviously an issue, but you also have to take a look at what is the public support for public higher ed at this point? How much money are the states giving higher education? Those monies have cut back. They started being cut back significantly at the Great Recession. They've, in some states, they've made it back. But when you take a look at from an inflation perspective, there isn't. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of competition out there. When you're bringing new programs on, you've got to make sure that they're going to be viable. Have you gotten input from the business community, the employers? Is this what's needed? Some of the mergers, what I've seen, and this is a little bit aside there, some of the mergers, their colleges are acquiring other colleges to be able to develop world-class programs in, say, accounting or whatever, so that when you're bringing a program on, when you're making changes, it's got to be needed and world-class. Agreed. Uh, what's going on at University of Arizona? Oh, oh, very sad. Very sad. They've got a budget, pro- budget problem. They miscalculated. What I understand is that each of the departments, colleges, took care of their own budgets, mm-hmm. and there was a miscalculation as far as how much cash was on hand. It's going to be ugly. The CFO has already left. According to their president, they're overspending about $45 million a year. Some people say it's due to administrative bloat. Central administration has grown by 69%. Other colleges by 31 This goes back to a lot of the regulation, but it also goes back to the structure of the colleges. Do you have a centralized administration that runs things, or do you push it down to the colleges and have better budget reporting? I don't know. I haven't dug into it that much, but it's not good. No, no. Anything else you want to talk about on the financial and budget side of things? Not really. It's not good. It's not pretty. Not pretty at all. And I really think that institutions have got to find a way to make degrees more affordable. You've got to figure out a way of doing things with less people. I mean, higher ed's in a mature to declining market from market forces. There's an oversupply of capacity and an undersupply of students or consumers. There's going to be fallout. How Mm -hmm. are you going to deal with it? And that's what we're, that's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So moving on, let's talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the area of curriculum. Oh my. (laughs) My. Boards sticking their noses into areas that they probably don't belong. Back to Florida again. Back to Florida again. (laughs) A fight between the college board and AP courses, the African-American studies, the psychology, back and forth, passing a controversial parents' rights and education, which essentially people knew that as don't say gay, prohibiting classroom discussion sexual orientation and identity, you know, kindergarten to third grade. It's not up to me to say whether that's right or not. But they're fighting with the college board, and the college board didn't budge. Mm -hmm. Students didn't want them to budge either. So it becomes down to the politics of higher ed, and it's unfortunate. Agreed. Agreed. Before we go on, we've got, Mm -hmm. you know, boards too, higher ed boards, who most folks are, I, I can't say most folks, legislate for public colleges, it's the, pre, the state governors or the legislature who appoints. 
And Mm -hmm. I've seen too many instances where it's the cronies that get put on the board. They get stayed on the board for a long period. And they don't change. They, They want things to stay the way they are, but they don't realize that the students have changed themselves. And so how do you meet the students where they are? This goes for the boards. This goes for faculty, whoever. We've got to meet the students wherever they are, give them our wisdom, and at the same time, let them grow and make the decisions for themselves Mm -hmm. on what they want and who they want to be when they grow up. I agree 100%. I also agree that, or I also believe that a lot of people on boards, they don't really understand higher education. No, no, they really don't. And it's sad, but in fact, it's true that, I mean, one state that I know the, the legislature got so mad at the board, they voted to disband the, the board for the system. And it took one senator in the other chamber to filibuster to make sure that didn't happen. Yeah. But, oh well. So I think that it's clear that disruption is needed. But we've been saying that for, we've been saying that for years. What are your thoughts about that? Well, Ryan Craig who's the managing director of Achieve Partners, and they're a private equity firm that invests in new educational models, you know, ed tech, et cetera. He he says that it needs to be disrupted. He says, you know, and I'm quoting from an article in Inside Higher Ed, despite dramatic changes in the American economy, college majors have remained largely unchanged. The same majors that were popular 40 years ago remain largely intact today. So we've got to make some changes. Technology is driving a lot of these changes, but we also need to make sure that there is a clear payoff that higher ed contributes to so students can get out and get a job. There was a study that came out of Georgetown University that said that students are not getting a, quote, good job until their 30s. Now, they mm-hmm. define good job as being able to make all the expenses, et cetera, mm-hmm. in their f- desired field. That's concerning. You know, the American dream, owning your own home. They're having to put this off. They're having to put having children off. Student loans are impacting a lot of this. I read a statistic that a huge percentage of young adults in their 20s are still being supported by their parents to some extent. Not fully, certainly, but parents are still having to contribute. That's frightening. It is. You know, I I jokingly say, you have kids. I said, yeah, and they're the best kind. They're grown, they're gone, and they're (laughs) (laughs) self-sufficient. But it's typical. Parents want their kids to have a better life than they did. Mm -hmm. And that's not happening anymore, or it's being delayed further and further. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to discount the I want it right now mentality, lack of patience to work for things. I don't want to discount that at all because it's true. We've given our kids, some people have given their kids everything they've wanted and the kids have an expectation that they should get it immediately. I mean, you see this, a student calls student services and they want something at 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this could probably have waited until 8.30 <laughs> right. or 9 o'clock tomorrow right. morning. morning right? Yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah. yeah. So what, when we talk about disruption, what's needed or what are you seeing that you think are promising developments that are going to help to disrupt higher ed? Technology is obviously. Technology has been a driver in our society for many years now. I mean, you stop and think about in 2007, we had the iPhone introduced. Mm-hmm. You know, that was what, 16 years ago? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How has that changed everything? Mm-hmm. I mean, AI. When, when you take a look at the major changes that we've had in society, the, the personal computer, initially when it came out, it was nothing until managers, you know, Lotus 1, 2, 3, an accounting program came out and they could do their budgets on their desk instead of having to go to the company mainframe. Mm -hmm. The internet and the World Wide Web, the browser, it's like that changed everything. The iPhone has changed everything. AI is going to change everything. 
we have no idea what it's going to be. Yep. And with every change, there's good and there's bad. But it is going to continue to drive everything. You know, I'm seeing a lot of innovation out there. Kentucky State, Bethany College, they're outsourcing their financial aid offices, mm-hmm. federal financial aid. That is a huge thing. I'll be willing to bet that we're going to see more institutions start to do that to cut down on some of the expenses. David Decker at Franklin, they have a system. I've never seen or heard of anything like this. Franklin actually increased enrollment. They're about 90% online. They actually increased enrollment during the pandemic. And right now they're at 10% increase or more every year over year. They have systematized transfers, community colleges. They have actually over 1,300 articulation agreements, and they know what courses actually translate over. They've got it all in the computer. So when a student says, I want to apply here, what's your community college? Boom. These are the courses. Send me your transcript. These are all the courses that apply, and you'll get credit for it. So they know instantly what that works. I've never seen anything like that Mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. Their course development too, what they do is they do all the market research, say, yes, this is what's going to work. This is good program. You have $4,000 to develop this course. Do it. It's not an unlimited budget, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So the advisory groups, the costs, They make sure the curriculum does what it's supposed to. One of the interesting things we're seeing in Illinois with community colleges is uh, community colleges opening up what what they're calling university centers, which Mm -hmm. they're partnering with four-year institutions to bring degree completion programs basically to the community college or to the community itself. So my own institution entered an agreement with McHenry County College with their new university center where we're we're providing degree completion programs on site there. So that the old model of we'll go to community college for two years and then come to a new city, come to a new town to complete your degree. No, they want to stay there. So take the degree completion programs to them. So it's interesting thing that we're seeing more and more of in Illinois, at least. Yeah, that's that's really important to be able to do those kind of things. Community colleges have gotten hammered for enrollment, Mm -hmm. but they're starting to pick up again. Mm -hmm. Make them relevant. Mm -hmm. What else are you seeing in terms of curriculum? I'm seeing some interesting things with respect to getting student input. For example, one of my favorite people, Philly Mantella at Grand Valley State University. She has started an initiative. It's been going on now for about three, four years called REP4, Rapid Education Prototyping for Change. They're going out and asking students, not college students, high school students, Mm -hmm. what do they want in their education? How do they want it delivered? Things like that. It's making a huge difference. And it's not just Grand Valley that's doing this. There's a consortium of now seven schools who are part of this, and they're passing this kind of information out. That's, I think that's really important. The Mm -hmm. other one is we're seeing far more dual enrollment. I've got mixed feelings on dual enrollment. I think it's great that you can have students being able to take college courses, going through high school for credit and, you know, satisfy. But in some ways, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got that. You've also got some colleges who are going down to a three-year bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you can get everything, if you can teach all the skills, great. But there's two things. One, you're cutting your own thing, your own finances. Two, are the students getting what they need from an academic perspective? And third, and people don't really stop and think about this, are the students mature enough after three years or if they've been able to take get an AA degree while they're in high school after two years to be out in the workforce? Or are they going to be still living at mom and dad's house, mm-hmm. you know, while they're getting things? So there's pros and cons to, you know, it's life. There's pros and cons to everything. Sure, sure. 
All right. Anything else you want to say about the year in review before we move on to predictions? Oh, my. (laughs) We're there already, huh? We've got to do a better job at controlling costs. We've got to do a better job at creating a shared vision. And we've got to stop letting politics getting into the university. It's a reality of life. We're in an election year. You've got to figure that. But come on, folks, where you've got people in Congress who won't talk to each other and they hate each other's guts because they're a Republican or they're a Democrat. This is not a good example for the rest of the world. Right. Or for our students. Agreed. So so prognostications. Yes. Let's have them. I already started. We're going to see more politics in higher ed. It's going to get worse before it gets better. So (laughs) it's an election year. Get ready to attend the theater of the absurd. (laughs) We're going to see, we're going to see enrollments continue to drop. I think the flagships will continue to do great. Regionals will hurt more. If you've got a thousand students or less at a private you're an acquisition target. If you do want to get acquired, if you think that's the only way you're going to do it, make sure you reach out early. Nobody wants to bring on a a college that has a really bad balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So reach out early. It's a tough decision that universities have to make, but yeah, we're going to see it. Uh, The public perception of value of a college degree, I think is going to continue to drop, but it's not a forever drop. It's going to start going up when we start making some changes. Mm -hmm. We're going to see more closures. We're going to see more acquisitions. We are, you mentioned it early, we we are in a mature to declining market. We have too much capacity and too many students. And we've got the demographic cliff coming up. Mm -hmm. So that is going to make things worse from an enrollment perspective. And it's also going to make things from a mergers or closures perspective. Technology, it's going to continue to create, disrupt. AI, your OPMs are hurting right now. Mm-hmm, they are. four people out there, and there's going to be some significant implications. The election is going to affect things. You're going to see more regulation if there's a Democrat in the White House. Again, if President Biden is reelected, we'll see less if Republicans. If the Republicans take the White House... We're going to see the accreditors more on the hot seat than they've ever been. It wouldn't surprise me with the Democrats as well, but, you know, there's a negotiated rulemaking going to be starting up talking about accreditors. So it's going to continue to be a a challenge. Uh, And then the pandemic is continuing to affect things. I think we're going to start see from a curriculum perspective more scaffolding because high school grads lost a couple of years because of the pandemic. There are programs out there. They found that if you have intense tutoring for four months, you can make up a full year. But professors are going to have to be forced to meet students where they are instead of taking the tact of, you know, you're in college now, we're not going to spoon feed you. Mm -hmm. All right, there it is. There it is. As Look usual. forward to grading you next year on how you do. But oh, it's certain to be an interesting year. It's certain to be an interesting year. Deb, thanks so much for joining me today. and uh, A putting pleasure me on, as always. Putting me on the hot seat. <laughs> so listeners, next time we get a real treat, we have Mary Papazian from AGB who's going to be talking about a special report that they put out with regard to governance. It'll be a great, great episode. Deb, thanks again for being on the show and look forward to the next time we get together. Me too, Drum. Thank you and happy holidays. Happy holidays. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show. And we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. 
Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.